Ephesians is arguably the second most influential New Testament letter. Second probably only to Romans. Why? In part because God's Spirit inspires Paul to write a beautiful exposition of what God has planned to do before time began in Christ. God's master plan to bring the whole cosmos together in Christ isn't just an interesting story, it's reality. And it is the central message of the book of Ephesians. It's real, it's historic, and it's epic. In this book, this letter to the church in Ephesus, God speaks through Paul to help us understand that you and I are a part of that story, the most real story in the history of histories, God's story of redemption. If you are a note taker, my title for today's sermon is Praise God from whom all blessings flow in Christ. Praise God from whom all blessings flow in Christ. And we're going to walk through verses 1 through 10 today. And there'll be five sub-points that I will unpack as we go along, each on the theme of praise. You'll notice as we stand now to read Ephesians, we'll be reading the first 14 verses. Go ahead and stand with me. Um, But today we'll only be unpacking the first 10 verses, and I'll tell you more of why that is. Let's stand together and read the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your servant Paul and the way that it is a miracle that you can work through a broken man by your spirit and speak, not only then but now, to us, your people. I pray as I have many times, not only for myself, but for us as a congregation, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your word has to teach us about you. And may, as, may we, as Kent prayed, leave here both hearers and doers of your word as you send us into your mission field, the greater Thief River Falls area. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Paul opens his letter by identifying himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. This is his divinely appointed credentials, as it were. Paul was made an apostle after the original 12. After the original 12, by the risen, resurrected Jesus. Not by popular election, not by lineage. So the title of apostle remains a messenger appointed directly by the living Jesus, and it's no longer a title that's up or an option after those who were with Jesus passed away. Paul 
the apostle to the Gentiles, as he often refers to himself, is writing to a church that he is very familiar with. One he spent over two years ministering to. And you can look up Acts 19 and 20 if you want to read about his actual time in Ephesus. Uh, it was interesting, for sure. Modern-day Ephesus is underwater. Modern-day Ephesus is underwater. I met a gentleman who actually got a chance to scuba uh, in and around the old buildings of Ephesus, said it was amazing. Um, it is modern-day Turkey, but it's underwater. The ocean has washed it away, and it is now a sunken city. Some scholars doubt whether Paul is really the author of the letter and whether he really wrote to the Ephesians. I'm only going to spend... Huh, 10 seconds talking about this. One, all of the early manuscripts, almost all, agree that Paul wrote this. No early church father doubted it. And two, so many of the manuscripts say to the church in Ephesus or to Ephesus that really that's good enough for me and it should be good enough for you too. Now, that's not to say this letter couldn't have been passed around. It probably was. As you and I stood for the reading of God's word, that would be very like what the first century Christians would have experienced, whether in a home or when they began to gather in larger buildings. Someone would have a letter of either the Old Testament or one of the New Testament Gospels or one of the letters from the apostles, and they would read it out loud to the people of God. <clears throat> now, Paul writes this letter sometime in A.D. 61 or 62. So this is less than 30 years after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. Just less than 30 years after. And Paul's imprisoned in Rome. And the old joke goes that if the only way you could get Paul to sit down and write the churches was to throw him in irons. So God does that. Reminding us in a minor way, or maybe in a major way to Paul, that God even uses our hardships for his glory. So Paul is in chains we don't know how long it is after this, but that he is crucified, suffering as a martyr for Jesus. Second Timothy being his last letter that we have <clears throat> written in the New Testament. And Paul is calling the Christians in Ephesus here saints, because friends, that's what we are. If you are in Christ, you are a holy one. You are set apart, not by your own merit, but by God. So if you find the word saint a little distracting because perhaps of the, the Catholic Church's definition of that, let that go. The New Testament gets dibs. Saints are what we are who are in Christ. Saints is how Paul addresses the church in Ephesus to remind them of who they are. Both Peter and Paul do this in their letters. And Paul adds that the Christians are not only uh, saints, but are faithful in Christ Jesus. And that ends verse 1. The saints are marked by their present faith in Christ Jesus, just as Paul. And last but not least, and we skip by this, we who have been walking with the Lord for a long time, look at verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, this is part of the formal letter that you will see in many of the letters in the New Testament, but it's not as if it's just something that's been written because you have to. Paul means these words, and it is a prayer as well as a blessing. It is a desire to see God's grace and peace working in their lives because he is the only means of supporting and supplying grace and peace in a world gone mad. And it is interesting to note that here we already have the three solas out of the five that the Reformation was launched on. Grace alone, faith alone, and in Christ alone. Well, our first header or our first sub point here is praise <clears throat> your heavenly Father for every blessing brought to earth in Christ. So if you're a note taker, verse three, praise your heavenly Father for every blessing brought to earth in Christ. Paul begins his letter here, friends, in an incredible outpouring of praise. This is unique to Ephesians. In fact, this these next verses, verses three through 14, may be unique in all of Greek literature. It's one sentence. What we read from verses 3 through 14 is one run-on sentence. 202 words, if my memory serves me right. So needless to say, it is impossible to diagram. If you ever had to do sentence diagramming for your English teacher, forget about it. 
Now that's impressive in and of itself, but what's more impressive is why Paul seems to run on in his language, because it's fitting. Paul's pearl string of praise is completely fitting because of who he's praising. He's praising the immeasurable, the incomparable, holy, triune God. The Father, Christ Jesus, the Son, and the promised Holy Spirit. All three are referenced in verses 3 through 14. So this isn't just, though, a theoretical treatise. This isn't Paul being a good nerd and writing out some really cool words about what he thinks about God. Friends, this is his praise service. These verses are worship. This is Paul, the man who used to organize the persecution of Christians, used to hunt them like dogs, who met Jesus on the road to Damascus and then was saved, converted, changed, and began serving him with his whole life, even, we believe, through church history to the point of death. So, These next verses, 3 through 10, which we'll focus on this week, and then 11 through 14 next week, aren't just kind of interesting ideas. This is a heart that overflows. This is the heart of Paul, a changed man. Well, he begins in verse 3, where all good beginnings start with God. Blessed be God. This is not a wish. This is a declaration And as one author points out, blessed or praise, by the way, might be a better way to translate that or at least more familiar, is the title and the topic of everything else we're going to say. So everything else I say right now is under the header praise. And I put a big exclamation point behind that. Praise or blessed be the God and Father. And then notice what Paul adds of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is through the Son that God has purposed to push and to flow all of his blessings. It is through the Son that God pours out his blessings. It is only through the Son, applied by the Spirit, but through the Son. There is no other way to receive God's blessings here on earth in this manner, in the special spiritual way that we're going to unpack, except through Christ except through Christ. So when we, in kind of our modern social media, talk about, you know, hashtag blessed, usually, and you look those up, and I did just a little couple weeks ago, you, you walk through some of those, and usually it's ways in which God has blessed us in, in a birth of a son or a daughter, uh, the, the marriage ceremony, uh, a, a job promotion, the, the house you love, right? That cup of coffee you get when the sun's out and it's just a beautiful day. Those are ways in which God commonly blesses anyone, whether you're a believer or whether you're not sure really if you believe or whether you love Jesus or you hate him. We call this common grace. And that's what the hashtag blessed stuff usually refers to. But that's not how you should read this here. When Paul writes, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, he's not talking about blessings that are common, a common overflow of God's just great and goodness to all of his creation. No, no, these are blessings that are through and only in Christ, applied by the Spirit. Paul is unpacking, friends, how Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension have become the only conduit for every spiritual blessing from the heavenlies that believers, you and I, family, experience here and now. And these will be unpacked in the next 12 verses. Blessings like election, predestination, our adoption, our redemption, our forgiveness, and our internal inheritance, not to mention the deposit of the Holy Spirit. The miracle that God himself actually resides, actually lives within one of his adopted children, you or me. These are the blessings that Paul is going to unpack for us. And these are why he cannot help himself but pour out praise. Remember, Good Friday, the curtain is torn. The curtain is torn. 
Something has changed. God is no longer housed in a man-made temple. He is now residing within. And Jesus is now Jacob's ladder. He is the source from which all things from heaven, where he reigns on high, come to earth again to his people. Let's begin or let's continue with verse 4. Praise God for our adoption in Christ. Let's praise God for our adoption in Christ. Paul continues, Even as he, that is, G, that is the Father, chose us in him, the Son. Let me read that again. Even as he, the Father, chose us in him, the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us, In the beloved. Paul's next statement isn't coincidental, rather, it's intentionally the first specific blessing that he praises God for. He praises God for choosing us in his Son. It's the first blessing. Thank you, God, for choosing me before the foundation of the world. And I want us to soak in this for a little bit. We need to back up and appreciate the majesty of the doctrine of election. We could spend a whole Sunday or more just on this. Christian brother or sister, in short, God chose you in Jesus Christ before he created the earth. God didn't choose you after you chose him. He didn't just choose you before you were born. He didn't just choose you because he was kind of feeling good that day. He chose you before these words, or in between these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In that little pause there, in the beginning, Genesis 1.1, God, before he created the heavens and the earth, he chose you. How? That's the mystery. But it's true. God chose you before the earth was formed. For the sun had heat, for the stars were hung in the galaxies, God chose you in Christ. It's incredible. It's amazing. And it's the reason why Paul starts first praising God for our election, our adoption in Christ. So after God creates the heavens and the earth, God, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, after God, uh, let me back up here. God chooses us, friends, before he creates the heavens and the earth. And if you've been struggling this week with self-esteem, your family of origin, your roots, your heritage, your circumstances, let that truth sink in. Let that truth sink in and blow apart whatever's got you bummed. Ask God to help your mind fully grasp how amazing that is, that before you or I ever had a single good or bad thought about God at all, our Heavenly Father chose you to be born and reborn in his son, Jesus. Not only that, but notice what Paul says next. He chose us that we should be holy and blameless before him. So this is the language of ethical or moral purity. This is the language of a sacrifice worthy of God in the Old Testament and borrowed by Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that all of life is now a sacrifice. This is language, friends, that reminds us that our election is not just about righting our past, present, or future sins or wrongs, but also the restoration of what God created us for in the first place. That is to be holy, worshipers free from shame of sin, set apart to praise him and serve him without any hindrances. Just as we try to grasp in the garden in chapter 3 of Genesis where Adam and Eve first felt shame. You and I have never known a day without shame. It's it's something we can't truly, fully comprehend. But God, who chose you in him, in his son, before creation, also plans to continue and keep you so that he can present you before himself as a trophy of his grace, holy and blameless before him. 
He will see you through the end. So now we have the doctrine of eternal security. What God started, he will finish. And that is amazing, amazing news. Now the preposition that is right before, prepositional phrase, right before verse 5, in love, could frankly, grammatically go with either verse 4 or verse 5. Grammatically. Uh, Scholars will tell you one or both. You know, one or the other. I think, frankly, it probably goes with verse 5, and that's how I'm going to teach this next part. But really, it's true in both. It is true in both senses. So God predestines us then. And what modifies that predestination in verse 5? In love. God predestines us in love for adoption. And that's why I think love is attached. Because adoption is love. In our day and age, in human sense, that parent who adopts that young boy or girl or that older young man or young woman does so out of love. That's the heart's motivation. So too, our Father, in purely holy ways, adopts us, predestines us in love. And notice what he says next. To himself as sons, and you can insert sisters, daughters, through Jesus Christ. So you and I who are in Christ have not only been elected before time began, we've been predestined. God has orchestrated that we would believe. He has moved. Although we are free, he has still moved so that we would worship him and be saved and for adoption. You and I are no longer outside God's family. We've been brought in. We're adopted sons or daughters. So whether you have a father or mother or whether you have a good father or mother, doesn't matter. You have a great heavenly father. It reminded me, I was one day in the, in the Hallmark section of the, of the uh, grocery store. And I, I, I can only say it must have been God's prompting. I bought a, a Father's Day card for God. I bought a Father's Day card for God. I don't really usually like to buy Hallmark cards. I frankly find them a little cheesy. Sorry, ladies. But I bought a card for my Heavenly Father. And I needed, I think, that day, and I have needed to remind myself of his character. That he is. God is not just an entity and an amorphous being, but he is like a father unto us. In fact, he is our great Heavenly Father. And it reminded me, and it still reminds me, that little Hallmark card, which I have now since lost, but this passage, which reminded me of it, reminds us, friends, that our earthly father must always be put underneath our heavenly father. There are lots of great fathers in this room, men who I am proud of, and I'm so glad to see them father their children well, but Men, we know we're sinners. Our wives will certainly tell us. (laughs) And our kids, when they get older, they will tell us. (laughs) And we will say, you know, I love you and I did my best, but I've been trying my whole life to point you to your heavenly father who's perfect and who loves you completely and will never fail you and will never let you down. He chose you before I even gave you a name, before your mother birthed you. So friends, we think of that as we remember that God, our Heavenly Father, has adopted us in Christ Jesus in the spirit of love according to the purpose of his will is the last part here at the end of verse 5. And that just reminds us that this wasn't a uh, a willy-nilly shopping spree where God's like, oh, I'm going to save him and her and her. I'm feeling really good today. Bam, 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 bam. No, no, no. This is purposeful. This is God's will. He does nothing out of chance or whim. He is unchanging. And in that, he chose you who are in Christ. Moving to verse 6. He chose you to the praise of his glorious grace. All that God the Father has done through the Son and through him alone is worthy of praise, and it is all grace. It is all grace. Amazing grace. We might even sing that hymn right now. Our election, our adoption, it is all a gift. Because remember, we were chosen first before we chose him. And it's all possible at the end of verse 6, through 
What does Paul say? He has blessed us in the beloved. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the beloved. That is Jesus, the one whom God the Father loves more than any being in the cosmos, his son, Jesus. We get to share in God the Father's love for his son as adopted sons and daughters. We are in that love triangle, Father, Son, and Spirit together. The literal Greek here echoes grace upon grace to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has quite literally graced us with. In him, verse 7 and 8, now we move to praising God for our forgiveness in Christ. Praising God for our forgiveness in Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. If you were here with us a few months ago during our gospel-centered series, you heard me say repeatedly that the gospel is a message, first and foremost, a message of good news about a past historical event that has secured our present rescue. And here, Paul is all about reminding us of this life-changing truth. In Christ, in him, we have redemption through his blood. Anyone, man, woman, or child who repents and believes, puts their faith in Christ's finished work, receives the gospel and all the benefits of what Christ has done on that pretty cross, which on Good Friday we were reminded was nothing but blood and gore. We should have, of course, hung on a cross. But Jesus, in his kindness, in his great grace, shed his blood for our redemption. Redemption is a powerful word, and I sometimes think we skip over it. It's a word that talks about freedom from some type of imprisonment or bondage. In our inherent plight as humans on this earth, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, Ever since that day in the garden, we have been separated from God. You remember in Genesis 3, God sets the cherubim, the angel, with the sword of fire to keep us from coming back into the garden and taking the fruit of eternal life. For then we would be eternally evil. It was a mercy that God gave us death as part of the curse. For we get a chance at second birth. We get a chance at second birth. And Jesus has purchased that chance through his blood. He has redeemed us. It reminds me of Israel and Egypt. Israel and Egypt had the will to be free. 400 years of slavery. They had the will, the desire to be free. But they had no means or power to do it. They had no way to redeem themselves. But God redeemed them through the blood of the Lamb. And he brought them through the Red Sea, the Red Sea of their rebellion, into a safe land. He brought them into his family. He made a people for himself. Not only is our debt in Christ, friends, paid, our sin paid or atoned for, but Christ's blood also satisfies God's wrath or our separation. He propitiates and brings us back, reconciles us to God. Our relationship is restored because of the blood of Jesus. We are forgiven of our trespasses, the second part of verse 7, all because or according to the riches of his grace, the riches or lavishness or prodigalness of his grace. Again, remember from our time in Luke 15, prodigal doesn't mean someone who runs off and abandons his father. It is somebody who is wasteful. It is somebody who is extravagant in what they do. The son goes off and spends his whole inheritance. He's a prodigal. He he, he wastes it all. He just lavishes it all and it goes away. It wastes it. It's carelessness, if you will. But as I argued, I think that parable should probably be called the prodigal God. Because in a sense, God has lavished on us grace. Grace upon grace, overflowing. Like the father in that parable who hikes up his hem of his robe 
which is unheard of, and runs to embrace his son and sends his men for a robe and a ring, dresses him, though he had no right to do so, or the son had no, he did not deserve that. But God was abundant in his grace. He was prodigal in his grace. And here, Paul is reminding us that in verse 8, God has lavished on us, prodigaled on us, the riches of his grace in all wisdom and insight. Again, reminding us, this is not a fickle father. This is planned, purposeful intent. Last but not least, verses 9 through 10, we praise God for making his mystery known in Christ. We, make, we praise God for making his mystery known in Christ. This lavish or prodigal God of the Old and New Testament has finally made obvious or made known to us what was always in the works, but was hidden in the unsearchable mind of God. That's what Paul means when he's talking about mystery here. Sometimes, more narrowly, he will focus on mystery in other ways, but he's talking about that before time, <clears throat> God knew that in the fullness of time, he would set forth his son, Jesus, hidden in the Old Testament, revealed in the New. And notice the purpose Notice the purpose, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ, verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This isn't just Paul on a random continuing tangent, friends. This is the culmination of all his praise. Did you catch it? It's profound. It's incredible that God has a grand plan to unite everything in Jesus. Now, um, the word rendered here, unite, might need a little work. The idea isn't so much unity among diverse peoples, you know, getting different factions together to actually work together like our government, right? We're not talking about that type of unity. We're talking about the consummation of all things. Like Like in a good novel, when all the different plot lines finally come together and there's resolution, or in Beethoven's Ninth, one of my favorite symphonies, the fourth movement, where Beethoven takes the the local hymn or the local song, Ode to Joy, and you've got this massive orchestra. Remember, Beethoven's almost totally deaf at this point. He wrote most of that symphony having cut the legs off his piano, put it on the floor so he could lay on the floor and get a better sense of the vibrations in his ears. No surprise, at that point, he put one of the biggest orchestras in history at that point on the stage, along with four incredible soloists and a massive choir, When we did it in college, it was a 100-person choir with a huge orchestra and four incredible incredible singers. But in that fourth movement, it's a sample of this singer and of that orchestral part, the woodwind solo, the percussion speak out, but everything has not come together. But there's an anxious energy. There's a sense of momentum in that symphony. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the words in German ring out, Freude, joy! And it all comes together. The whole orchestra, the singers and the choir speak out, sing out, joy. That's what God has done in Christ. From Genesis 1-1, and even before the counting of time, God has been working. And every passage in the scriptures is a little tributary, is is a little path that comes together in Christ. We sing these songs about him because we will sing them for all eternity. And as other authors have said better than I can, we, our joy will not expire or wane, but it will grow because we'll have new, perfect bodies. We will have no longer any shame, any sin encumbering us, sending doubts into our heads about whether we really mean what we sing we will be able to sing with joy for all eternity. That, friends, is the plan brought now in the full, almost in the fullness of time. Christ has not come back yet. We are waiting. We are living in the already but not yet. But we have a taste of it in these heavenly blessings. We have a taste of it here when we fellowship together. So friends online, if you can be here with people, get in here. You're missing out on what God intended. The people from all nations and tribes and tongues, 
from all backgrounds, from all pasts, from the prodigal son to the prostitute to the preacher's kid to the goody two-shoes to the orphan to the man, whatever skin or woman, whatever skin or color, to the person who's struggling with whatever uh, they are in their sexual orientation. All things will be made right and brought to completion in Christ with joy. So how do we live this incredible passage? How do we apply these incredible words? First and foremost, believe and praise him. We're not going to talk yet about what to do, what works or what you should or shouldn't do. Read, believe, and respond in praise. So this week, if you want some homework, here's my homework. Read and pray through each line of this passage and praise God with Paul. Praise him in your prayers and watch how God warms your heart, how God begins to entice and inflame your affections. Not only for him, but then watch. You'll start to love others more. You'll start to see them as his precious people, whether lost or found. So first and foremost, friends, before we go out on a journey of missions, we need to taste and eat Christ's meat as Paul has presented it here. Meditate on these words, the old word, mumble them, memorize them. I am admittedly very bad at memorizing scripture or lines as an actor and a singer. I've always struggled with it. I'm very good at concepts. I'm terrible at word for word. This is the only passage of scripture I've ever been able to memorize. God's grace, I was able to memorize the first chapter of Ephesians. My wife pointed out that in my very first Bible, yeah, the pages were rubbed worn. Uh, So, Family, God the Father hasn't spared anything through his Son for you. He's not spared anything. Every blessing, every spiritual blessing, election, adoption, forgiveness, all are available through Christ. Christian, believe, soak. Man or woman or child who's struggling, is your heart dry? Soak it in the word. With a simple prayer, Lord, give me the grace to have more faith to believe what you have written. And ask him, ask him boldly. Go to your heavenly father through the son who is the high priest and ask boldly. If you're depressed, friends, welcome to your spiritual medication. This doesn't replace other means, but this is your spiritual medication. Again, it doesn't replace other means, other help. But let the word give you cheer and joy. And perhaps last, but certainly not least, don't do this alone. Share it with your spouse, your friends, with others. Our Christian faith is not meant to be lived alone. We are sheep. And when a sheep gets alone, it gets attacked by the wolves. Don't be that solo sheep. Don't be that victim of Satan's ploys. Fellowship, share. And I pray that today and for the next few months, you will see your part in the grand narrative of God's story of redemption. Friends, you in Christ are already a part. And today, if you are not in Christ, if you repent and believe in him, putting all your hope on Christ to pay for your sin and to bring you to the Father, you've now joined the greatest story in history. And you'll be rejoicing with your brothers and sisters for all eternity. May God continue to do this work in our lives in this week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Oh, we thank you for Jesus. We praise you. We cannot perhaps come close to the masterful way which Paul does, but oh, let us by bite-sized morsels taste and eat your goodness now and this week. Stir our affections. Fan those little flames in our heart into a burning passion for you, a heart on fire to worship you and praise you. Thank you that you will answer this prayer. You love Jesus to answer this prayer for you, 
know what it's like to suffer the doubts and the attacks of the enemy. And even more so, you know how you fought every one of them. You never gave in to temptation. As it got harder and harder, you never gave in. We are so weak, we fold so quickly. We doubt without even realizing it. So encourage us this week. Holy Spirit, through your word written here, do surgery on our hearts and help us to be men and women and children who not only love God, but love our neighbor and share the good news that we get to eat and devour and relish in. In Christ's name and for his glory, we pray. Amen.